Um, I'm Ellie Brooks, President of the Friends of the Jewish Holocaust Centre. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today and a special welcome to our dear survivors to this wonderful centre and thank you for attending tonight. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to the Bonong people of this region, to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to introduce you to our very distinguished panel tonight. Dr Margaret Taft, Dr Anita Zeltzer and Dr Anita Freeman are all children of survivors and together with Professor Andrew Marcus, they'll explore the retelling of their family's stories. Holocaust remembrance is an important part of our Australian Jewish identity. Why do we need to remember the Holocaust? Each panellist has their own story which represents the past and frames our identity. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Andrew Marcus, who really needs no introduction here, as he's been involved in the centre for probably longer than I have. He is, and always has been, a great, a great resource and a mentor to the centre. Um, Andrew is the Pratt Foundation Research Professor of Jewish Civilisation at Monash University and is a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Andrew has published extensively in the field of Australian race relations and immigration history. Since 2007, he's been Senior Researcher for the Scanlon Foundation Social Cohesion Research Program which in 2018 conducted its 11th national survey. He's the principal researcher on the Australian Jewish Population Research Project. His book, A Second Chance, The Making of Yiddish Melbourne, co-authored by Dr Margaret Taft, was published in 2018. So I'd just like to welcome Andrew and um, hand over to him as moderator of tonight's panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellie. Can you hear me in the back? Is yeah. it working? Yes, good. So welcome, everybody. Um, you know, you, I, given the sort of theme of what we're talking about today, so writing about the Holocaust with a local context as it impinges on the Melbourne Jewish community. Um, and Ellie, you made the point that I've been involved here for a few years. I was in, involved in the in 90s. I had the great pleasure of seeing this institution grow. And the point is that at that time, amongst the first generation who built this very significant institution, there was a questioning, well, what will happen after us? Who will be interested? Um, is this like the, a last flowering that will have um, no continuity? because people won't be interested. And the reverse has happened. Um, and in a way, the works that we're hearing about today testifies to that, that the Holocaust has not lost its resonance and its significance. Um, and amongst the many people here today, we're fortunate to have Professor Christopher Browning, um, who's been one of the foremost historians of the Holocaust. And this institution, we've had a wonderful passing parade of the most eminent speakers in the world. And I think people do recognise that the Melbourne Jewish community is very distinctive, very distinctive, in that it was a community that was, in a fundamental way, shaped by the survivors who came here some before the war, some after the war. Um, and my colleague Margaret Taft will be talking about some of those issues, drawing on the book that we put together um, over a period of many years. <laughs> book. Just happened just, to have just it. Happened to have it. <laughs> um, if you haven't yet got it, um, you may be interested. I mean, we're thrilled, aren't we, that every now and again someone will write to us and say, including one very eminent um, professor 
uh, earlier age. Yes. Um, who wrote to us, was it Monday or? Yeah. yeah. and said how much he enjoyed the book. Um, I don't take necessarily sort of personal pride out of that. I read that and I'm sure you do as well, that people recognise it as significant, as a significant history. So Margaret, Dr. Margaret Taft is a research associate at the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization at Monash. She's a published author, an experienced researcher, teacher and lecturer. And you know, I had the great pleasure, which I think must be almost unique in the academic world, that I supervised Margaret's uh, MA prelim when we had those. Yep. And I was involved in supervising her doctorate. And Dayanu, I was involved in supervising the doctorate of her daughter, Jessica. True. Um, so Margaret is the youngest child of Holocaust survivors. Her personal and professional interests lie in Jewish immigrant experience and the reconstruction of life in the post-war period. Her publications include the emergence and development of the Holocaust Witness, which was particularly focused on the 1940s. And we co-authored a study of Walter Lippmann, the Australian Walter Lippmann, who was a major community leader um, in the post-war period. And of course, our book, Second Chance. Margaret is a Yiddish speaker who spent her formative years in the vibrant immigrant community of Thornbury, where my Simone also had some connection um, before shifting south of the Yarra. So Margaret, I've said enough. What do Thank you think? You. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. And as has been said to you already, for me, Holocaust remembrance is both personal and professional. I am the child of two Holocaust survivors who, like so many of you here, grew up with many family stories of unfathomable loss and miraculous survival. After my parents had passed away, I began on a spirit, spiritual in one sense, but very professional journey spurred on by historical interest in the development of Holocaust testimony and commemoration, in part because I wanted to understand my parents' experiences, the stories they told me, but within a historical context. In other words, I wanted to fill in a lot of the blanks, things they couldn't have known and wouldn't have been able to tell me. So let me begin and try to give you some historical framework, perhaps for understanding your own family stories and more so an understanding of how and when this particular form of storytelling all began. And I would like to begin by dispelling two very pervasive myths. One is what we call, and what the late David Cesarani called, the myth of silence. And both of these myths, as you'll know, or we will see, are interconnected. <coughs> Silence, the first myth, is that victims and survivors never spoke of their experiences either during or immediately after the Holocaust. That survivor testimony as we know it today is a relatively new phenomenon, arising in the last 30 years as ageing survivors felt compelled to finally tell their stories for posterity before they left this mortal coil. That in the early years of survival, this is part of this built up mythology, they were all too traumatised to speak out and were too busy trying to resurrect their lives and rebuild their communities. The second myth is that commemoration of the Holocaust is also a relatively new phenomenon, that in the early years the world just wanted to forget and move on. In part, that was true. But for the survivors, it was not. Certainly Yom HaShoah, in its present intergenerational incarnation is relatively new, but commemoration is as old as the Holocaust itself. On the 2nd of March 1941 <coughs> in Vilna, some three months before the Nazis invaded Russian-occupied Lithuania, a young man wrote a letter to his sister. This postcard will be my farewell to you. Be well, Elsa. Keep on going. I remember you. If something happens, I would want there to be somebody who would remember that someone named David Berger had once lived. 
Not only does David have a sense of foreboding, but he has a premonition of his death. What is his response? David asks for one thing, to be remembered. On the 23rd of June 1941, one day after the Nazis have invaded Lithuania, Polish-born Hermann Crook, a studious librarian from Warsaw, made a fateful decision to remain in Vilna. If I am going to be a victim of fascism, I will take pen in hand and write a chronicle of a city, Crook wrote in his diary. I will be the mirror and the conscience of the great catastrophe. Crook was murdered in an Estonian labour camp on the 18th of September 1944, but not before he buried his precious diaries in front of six witnesses, one of whom survived and returned to retrieve them after liberation. In a letter to his two children on the 19th of October 1943, Dr. El Hanan, head of the Kovna Ghetto Jewish Council, wrote, Remember, both of you, what Amalek has done to us. Remember this and don't forget it your whole lives and pass this on as a sacred will to the next generation. Now, I would argue that these personal letters and these diaries, which invoke the sacred injunction to remember, the commandment Zahor, are also individual acts of commemoration, which, of course, is an act of remembrance. It's a means of perpetuating the story of what befell these people as individuals and what that came to symbolise by extension for the Jewish people. This private act of writing and documenting is actually a public statement, a plea to keep telling the story. With the end of the war came an explosion of written testimonies collected largely by the survivors themselves as well as published memoirs all of them individual statements in which the authors felt compelled to document and record the great catastrophe, not only as an historical document, but as a means of perpetuating this story, which they felt compelled to tell. Yad Vashem has over 18,000 testimonies from the period 1944 to 48, collected by the Jewish historical commissions, survivor-based organisations that were dotted throughout liberated Europe and also they have close to 500 diaries that were retrieved after they were kept hidden in the ghettos and camps. These testimonies and diaries are raw, graphic, visceral accounts of all that these individuals see, hear and experience. They often tell us, interestingly enough, very little of the author themselves because that's not the point of the, of the diary or of the testimony. Rather, they are telling the story of a people. Hundreds of Holocaust memoirs were published around the globe between 1944 to 49. I think I made a count of some close to 300 of them. In over 30 languages, but the dominant language, over 50% of them were written in Yiddish. These memoirs tell a particular story of the Holocaust by a particular group of survivors, and it is in these publications that are most closely linked to the early forms of public commemoration for these memoirs often tell of heroic resistance. Survival is portrayed through acts of personal agency, through often violent confrontation with the enemy. Those who confronted the final solution, who took up arms or who de deliberately sabotaged the Nazi extermination machine in a struggle for survival were the first survivors to be venerated, the first to have the moral authority to speak on behalf of the survivor community. As an example, Yankel Wienicks, A Year in Treblinka, published in New York by the Bund in 1944. Wienick was a member of the uprising in Treblinka. He um, escaped in August of 43 into the forests. He writes a riveting account, which was published in Polish, um, about how he, he takes an axe and he's chased by the guard and he turns around and he uses in Yiddish a biblical term, I smote the enemy. I smote him. And it is quite a, an, um, it's a, it's a heroic story and he ends on that note. Now we know later what happened to him and he went on to um, join the Polish resistance and he fought in the August uprising in Warsaw and his little, tiny little document was smuggled out by the Polish underground to London and from London it was sent to the Bund in New York. That was in 44. Marek Edelman's The Ghetto Fights, published in Polish in 1945 in Warsaw, 
Marek Edelman was a member of the uh, Jewish brigade, the, the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, also an extremely heroic um, document. Olga Lengel's Five Chimneys, published in 1947. She was in Auschwitz and she was a medical assistant who looked after the women and, and also said that she was a courier for the Sonderkommando. Gisela Pearls, I was a doctor in Auschwitz, published in 1948. Gisela Pearl was a, a doctor and a gynaecologist who saved many women's lives, mostly by performing abortions on them. The early forms of public commemoration and memorialisation focused on heroic resistance. Survivor identity and the survivor as a new public figure became inextricably linked to an enduring heroic narrative. Kibbutz Yad Mordechai, established near the Gaza, what is now the Gaza border in 1943, is arguably one of the first Holocaust memorials to be built in Israel. When its founders, who were members of Hashem Hatzair, immediately adopted the name after hearing of the heroic stand taken in the Warsaw Ghetto by the uprising commander Mordechai Analevich, a member of the movement. During the war years in Melbourne, public days of mourning were declared by the rabbis and advertised in the Jewish news as an expression of communal loss and as an act of commemoration. In 1944, even before survivors were actually arriving in Melbourne, on the first anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a commemoration was already held in Melbourne. Throughout the 1950s, commemoration of the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt attracted between two to 3,000 attendees, mostly survivors. Because of the huge crowds, commemorations then were held in three different venues, the Samuel Myers Hall in St Kilda, the Kadima and the Assembly Hall in Carlton. By the late 1950s, it already had to be moved to the Melbourne Town Hall. It was still oversubscribed. Throughout the 50s, many still considered Holocaust remembrance as being the sole domain of the survivor. It was not yet owned as such by all sections of the community. And this was also often a point of great contention. And in 1961, a young journalist by the name of Sam Lipsky, writing for the Jewish News, referred to the Australian-born Jews when he asked, where are they? Have they no need to remember? What will be said when those who come are no longer with us? And in an effort to spread the message of the Holocaust, in the same year, 61, a Warsaw Ghetto exhibition was staged at the Melbourne Town Hall, organised by a committee that represented now the entire Jewish community. It had well over 6,000 visitors, including non-survivors and non-Jews. It, who viewed the exhibition before it was trans, transferred to Mount Scopus College and it made the front page of the Herald Sun and the Herald as it was then the afternoon paper. By 1964, all forms of active resistance in all of the camps, the forests and the towns were recognised at the Warsaw Ghetto commemoration. All acts of defiance and active confrontation with the enemy were upheld as models of survival. This provided a pathway forward a way to be seen that you live life and you could defy death. The organising committee was now a broad range of every, every organisation within the community. Ownership of Holocaust commemoration was spreading out and its demographics were shifting too. The St Kilda Town Hall became a more suitable venue. The growing success of temporary exhibitions, a means of telling the story again of the Holocaust in an accessible form throughout the 60s and the 70s gave impetus to the notion of a more permanent museum to memorialise the Holocaust. The outstanding success of the 1980 Holocaust exhibition displayed in the exhibition building with some 7,500 attendees and over 2,500 school students demonstrated the need for a more enduring exhibition. Those who were instrumental in founding the Holocaust Museum in Melbourne in 1984 were also big players in these early exhibitions of 1953, 1961 and 1980. Just to mention, Aaron Sokolovich, Ursula Flicker, Saba Feniger, Bonavina, Avram Zelesnikov, all of whom were survivors. Mina Fink, although not a survivor, but who had been a leading light in the resettlement of Holocaust survivors in Melbourne in the post-war years, as chairperson of the appeals committee, not only donated $50,000, which together with funds from the Federation of Polish Jewry and the Kadima secured the purchase of 13 Selwyn Street, 
but she also continued to be a leading light of the museum. It was Minna's vision that the museum have an educational focus, to not just be a static memorial, to educate future generations against the consequences of racism that steered the museum towards its current mandate as a leading educational institution with hundreds of thousands of students already having passed through its doors. Holocaust commemoration held by the various Landsmannschaften were more personal and exclusive and went some way in addressing the need for private mourning. These events, though still public affairs, were smaller and more intimate. And in this way, the survivors could link their own personal tragedy with those of the communities from which they came and with whom they shared common experiences. These commemorations tended to be sombre affairs and took the form of Yiskor evenings, with prayers for the dead, recitations, songs, the partisan hymn always was sung, and of course, Hatikva, Israel's national anthem. They continued to be conducted predominantly in Yiddish and remained an important part of the Landsmannschaften calendar. Now, by the mid-80s, Holocaust commemoration had adopted a new name, Yom HaShoah, with the subtitle Jewish Day of Remembrance. And up until the mid-90s, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising remained a central focus. But after this, the focus started to shift gradually, and it broadened to include a wider narrative of diverse Holocaust experiences and responses of the six million victims, and most recently of the survivors, which now includes the children of survivors, referred to as second and third generation. I hope in this very short period of time I've given you a bit of an understanding of the role played by the early personal individual storytelling in those formative years of Holocaust remembrance, its part in the ongoing development of a public Holocaust commemoration that now embraces what is essentially a consensual Australian Jewish social memory of the Holocaust in its broadest manifestations. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, one of these earlier commemorations, like the town hall? Like, how did it come to be at the town hall? What was on show? Who, who attended? The, um, the early, like the ones at the, at the, the very early ones, like in the Samuel Myers Hall and, and of, of those sorts of things. Whatever look, you look in the 50s and 60s, they started to bring out resistance fighters who are actually guest speakers at, at, at many of these commemorations. Uh, Heike Grossman came out. Avram Sutskever was here in 1961. Um, Avram Sutskever was a um, partisan and resistance fighter in, um, who, from the Vilna ghetto. He had escaped in and he actually fought with the one of the brigades, he went, he was then taken to, he was considered a very important partisan and he was airlifted out by the, by the Soviets to save him and he remained in Moscow until the war had ended. But he and um, was brought out, as I said, in 1961 as one of the very early ones. So they, they still focused around it. Um, it tended to be uh, controlled and organised by People like Avram Zeleznikov, who came here in the early 50s, took a leading role in the organisation of it. They were predominantly, a lot of Yiddish was spoken. This was an issue that they had to address. Um, other organisations within the community said that if you wanted to bring more people in, you have to start you know, meeting the needs of an audience that wasn't necessarily the, just the Yiddish speakers. And that was a point of, of difference. But yet yeah, they still, they always would finish with the partisan hymn, and um, which I think is still sort of sung and, and used as, as, again, a heroic yeah. element. So, uh, yes, they were lighting the six candles, all of that sort of thing is early and symbolic from those sort of times. But they were heavily subscribed and there was no shortage of people who wanted to go to them. <laughs> and what was the attitude, for example, the Lord Mayor and so on, the, the, the Australian community? To well, this? certainly for the 1961 exhibition, the Lord Mayor and all of them were very happy to be found, seen photographed with it. And, and um, the Archbishop of Melbourne at the time, and I've forgotten his name, um, viewed the exhibition, made public statements about it. So there was, as I said, a sort of growing awareness and interest, uh, very much so. But you get that sort of movement towards the temporary exhibitions, which, which take, is the sort of forerunner to the museum, and they saw the success of that. But it was certainly drawing an interest from um, the non-Jewish community at that time, the leaders of the community. 
And the last question, this is a more speculative one. Yes. But, but how would you explain the way that remembrance has grown in significance now to the third and fourth generations and, and the way that people outside the Jewish community... I finished with this notion of a consensual social history of the Holocaust. Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a really big question that you're talking about because this interest in the growth and the interest in testimony that we see this explosion since the 1990s, it's really a broader issue in the development of the interest in social history and the development in an interest of the victim rather than, you know, history and the social history and the interest in individual stories, which is a much bigger um, sort mm -hmm. of issue. And the Holocaust sort of, and those stories came into that. Um, so uh, the, the growth of it is part of a bigger story and in the growth of, I mean, even the word trauma that we use now is a relatively new word. It was brought across from the, um, it was a psychiatric term used in the 1980s that was then suddenly brought into issues of social trauma and, um, and that became, you know, so there's been lots of different shifts, if you like, socially and historically in what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Anita Seltzer. Dr. Seltzer writes about non-fiction for children and adults with an interest in women and history. She's written six books about us. Is it more than six now? Ten. Ten. Well, I've got six here. <laughs> All right, six plus four. Six on, on the sport, sorry. On the sport, yes. About Australian sports women who achieved at high levels. Girls' education, governors, wives, and the pastoral pioneers of Como House. Anita developed a women's studies course for Swinburne University after completing her graduate diploma. She's the daughter of Holocaust survivors, and her most recent book, I Am Sasha, is based on her father's story, retold using her grandmother's memoirs. Before becoming a writer, Anita was a teacher of English and politics, and completed masters and doctorates degrees in education focusing on gender and history. And, and where do you complete those degrees? Monash. At Monash University. Monash. Good. I didn't know the answer to that before I asked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to just start by telling you the story of my grandmother, um, how I Am Sasha came to be. So in 1994, my grandmother handed me a manila folder with typed loose leaf pages in the folder. And she said to me, you have what you need here, the story of how your father and I survived the Holocaust. You are now becoming a writer and I want you to know how we did it. I want you to write the book, tell the world and have it published, promise me. Being very close to my grandmother, I promised to try. It wasn't until 20 years later that I actually read the contents of the folder. I'd been busy raising three precious children, writing and getting nine books published and completing my PhD. Then one day, something compelled me to take out the folder out of my desk drawer and read the contents. When I, was, when I did, I was blown away. Growing up, Nana would tell me repeatedly, your father, survived the Holocaust as a girl, you know, but never mentioned any details. As Margaret said, they didn't talk about it in those days. My dad would say, I should have died in the war and every day is a bonus just to be here. He preferred not to talk about the war like many Holocaust survivors. So in that folder lay my grandmother's memoir and it begins with her life as a young girl in Schwabe, Poland, that was around 100 kilometres from the cosmopolitan eastern city of Lvov, also known as Lemberg and Galicia, and Ukraine today. Nana wrote about her family and traditions in Poland, progressing to meet my grandfather, 18 years her senior. He was a barrister and she met him applying for a job as a legal secretary. She became his legal secretary. She was an excellent typist with accounting and other skills. 
Her story continues with their courtship, subsequent marriage and birth of my father and untimely death of my grandfather, aged 40. My dad was only two. In the pages of the memoir, her journey through life as a widowed mother is shared, working as sole breadwinner and looking after her child. By the time he was nine, World War II broke out. In the memoir, the worlds of the private and the public become one, as Nana's focus is to keep her son safe and alive during the Holocaust. Nazi orders, war events and incidents are recorded along with their effects on her and my father, their daily life in hiding. She and my father survived due to their defiance, courage, resilience and luck of course. The story. My Nana was defiant. She stood up to the Nazis through defiance against their orders and she protected my father in this way. The following examples illustrate how. First of all, she refused to go to the Lvov ghetto because she said it was a death sentence for them, enclosed in a cage. Then she wouldn't wear the Star of David armband that publicly declared their Jewish identity. My grandmother was asked to join the Judenrat, the Jewish council that administered the affairs of Jews, looking after sanitation, food and shelter, for example. She refused because the council had to carry out Nazi orders and she believed this Nazi control wouldn't enable members to look out for their best, the best interests of the Jews. She, the next act of defiance was joining Zhugota, the Polish underground, to help save other Jews by creating false identity papers for them. But the most amazing act of defiance was to transform my 13-year-old father into a girl in 1942 when the concentration camps were in full swing. Nana and Dad, now 13, were in hiding and options running out to keep safe and hidden from the Nazis. My grandmother obtained false identity papers for Dad and her to assume a different identity. Nana felt he was at greater risk as a boy if the Nazis accosted him, they could order him to pull down his trousers and his circumcision would give his Jewish identity away. He would be shot or sent to a concentration camp. She taught him how to talk and walk like a girl. Verbs in Polish are gender-based, so he had to learn how to speak that way. And she also taught him to walk with a book on his head so he carried his carriage directly like she thought girls did. How did I feel when I heard of the story? Well, I didn't really hear the story, I read the story. And what did I do with the memoir after I read it? Firstly, I, I couldn't believe the details of the, their journey, which are uh, documented in I Am Sasha in story form. I felt a huge responsibility to tell my grandmother's story and get it published as I had promised her. And I also felt the responsibility towards my father who had written a short story in his lifetime, submitted it to be published in the 1960s, but it was rejected and I think probably it was something to do with the times and he didn't really talk about how he felt um, assuming this identity, he just did the skeleton facts. But the fact that he submitted his story to a publication told me he wanted it shared with the outside world. So that was my personal responsibility. In the bigger picture, I felt the story should be told and shared so that readers learn about what happened in the Holocaust, my family's story included as part of that bigger event. So in 2013-14, I originally wrote a manuscript based on her memoir entitled Saving Sasha and told in her voice. So my grandmother was the narrator. I sent it out to publishers and re received either letters of rejection or offers to publish that did not sit well with me. Then a friend introduced me to the former director of Penguin Books, Bob Sessions, who's become a friend and he works as a publishing consultant. He read the ma manuscript and said to me, your story is amazing and it needs to be told, it needs to be published. But he advised me to rewrite it in the voice of the boy voice of my father and that way it has a chance of being um, published and going out into schools and educating young people as well as general readership. 
Needless to say, after spending a long time writing a story which was not my genre because history and, and um, a different kind of writing was my, my background, was pressing my buttons. But I'd come this far and I couldn't let my grandmother down or my father. So I gave it a go and I wrote I Am Sasha. He submitted it to Penguin Books and the publisher there and editor read it overnight, both cried, loved it, and contacted me very shortly and offered me the contract and I Am Sasha was on its way. My intent was for the book to be taught in schools as an educational tool. And successfully so far, Marcelin College, a large Catholic boys' school, is teaching I Am Sasha next term. I've been invited to go and speak to 240 boys. They have replaced the boy with the, the striped pyjamas with I Am Sasha, and I'm delighted. I'm hoping other schools will follow. The book is already a bestseller in Australia. It looks like it will be the basis of a play that my brother-in-law is writing and has adapted. And an LA producer has got it now, looking for filmmakers wanting to make a movie. And we're hoping that that happens. It's a long, long way off. I've had a braille rights sale and hope that international rights sales will follow. Understanding Jewish identity. My grandmother's memoir has given me an understanding of my Jewish heritage on my paternal side, their customs and traditions. It has strengthened my own Jewish identity, although this is something I have felt all my life strongly Jewish. Her memoir documenting what she and dad went through in the Holocaust, the terror and atrocities and genocide, reinforces how subsequent generations like mine and others in the future need to carry and propel our strong Jewish identity forward. In her new book, Antisemitism Here and Now, historian Deborah Lipstadt has a few words to say about her Jewish identity that I'd like to share and comment on. And this is what she says. Although I have devoted most of my professional life to the study of the persecution of the Jews, that has never been what has driven me personally as a Jew. I value and celebrate my tradition and its teachings. My awareness of the many grievous wrongs that have, perpetuate, have been perpetuated against Jews throughout history is not the foundation of my Jewish identity. Jewish culture and Jewish history constitute the foundation of who I am. End of quote. I would have thought, this is me talking, that in Jewish history, genocide committed against the Jewish people, namely the Holocaust, would have been a large part of that history that she talks about. Professor Lipstadt feels quite strongly about her view as she imparts another message to the readers of her book. Quote, I entreat you to avoid letting this longest hatred, namely anti-Semitism, become the linchpin of your identity. Jewish tradition in all its manifestations, religious, secular, intellectual, communal, artistic, and much more, is far too valuable to be tossed aside and replaced with a singular concentration on the fight against hatred. Professor Lipstadt was raised in a traditional Jewish home. She attended private Jewish schools. Her parents were active volunteers in the community. But neither parent lived through the Holocaust. Her father was born in Germany and came to the US in the 1920s, and her mother, born in Canada, immigrated there in the 1920s too. I think the fact that her parents were not Holocaust survivors has, contrib has contributed to how she views her Jewish identity. For me, the experience of being second generation of Holocaust surviving parents impacted on me very greatly in terms of how I feel about my Jewish identity. It is not the only way I see myself as a Jewess. I love hearing and dancing to the horror, music playing, at Jewish weddings. I love the breaking of the glass under the chuppah and its layers of meaning. I love that we eat special food like challah on Friday nights and haroset during Pesach. My aunt used to make tzimus, carrots slowly cooked for Rosh Hashanah. And I think that there's, there are wonderful artists, Jewish artists we need to celebrate. But for me, I feel a huge need to carry on the legacy of my roots and preserve the story of my father and grandmother surviving the Holocaust, and this is a, part, a big part of my Jewish identity. 
I feel that my Holocaust heritage is la a large part of who I am as a Jew and that all stories about the Holocaust need to be told to forthcoming generations in the hope that such an event never happens again to our Jewish people. I Am Sasha shares the story of my father's survival and as a teenage girl and his experiences with the public world now. His past and war experiences, along with my nana's, have played a large role in the formation of my identity. The effect of telling, how does the retelling of the story contribute to Holocaust remembrance? My book, I Am Sasha, keeps the story of the Holocaust alive. It documents historical facts and it illustrates the lengths people went to in order to survive. It weaves the world of the public with the private and informs readers of different generations of a very dark period in Jewish and world history. It helps us remember that terrible time and event and teaches us about a past that must never repeat. Thank you. There's an issue with some Holocaust memoirs <coughs> or narrative stories in that people question their authenticity. Um, it's happened a number of times with like best-selling works and then have been found, you know, that uh, there weren't, things weren't as they had described them. Um, has that been an issue for you because you're telling the story in the first person? Well, I made sure that I checked anything she might have written as historical um, reading about the history. So it, I just didn't, I didn't take her word for everything that happened. I read her work and then I looked at the history and made sure it supported what she said. Yes. So, I, you know, I did it that way. But has it been an issue that someone thought that this was actually, you know, first person account and then found that um, it, it wasn't? Has that been an issue? No, at all? not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, good. What do you think explains the interest? Because obviously it's a very compelling and um, in some ways a unique uh, story, but we probably have thousands of books out there. So, so why don't people leave it and move on? I think this story is quite unique because of the gender bent and the times yes. that we live in. Yes. Um, gender is a big issue in our society today and the fluidity of gender. So I think uh, that has attracted attention. And um, that photo, can I hold up the book? Please. Oh, Thank you. So the photo on the cover is my father, dressed as a girl as he pretended to be in 1942 for 18 months or so. And the clever designer of Penguin has placed the image of a male underneath um, so that we have the duality. And I, I think this, you know, this gender issue has been a very strong part and also yeah. maybe the, the, um, the power of the young boy's voice has made an impact as well. Yeah. Uh, so probably those two things. So it's not just, like, it, it stands out. It stands out. Yeah. It's different there. To my knowledge, I've not read anything. I've read about little boys, you know, redressing, but not someone 13 going through adolescence and puberty and the voice about to break and, yes. you know, that significant developmental time in a person's oh. life. How long did it take you to, oh. um, you know, from the earliest ideas about writing the book? Uh, to actually seeing it. Uh, okay, so 2013-14 uh, I started. It took me a year to write it and, and as I said, the genre was foreign to me because yeah. I wrote straight uh, history. Suddenly I'm writing a story, so I've got characters, I've got places, I've got dialogue. It's like learning a whole new thing. Um, so I had to somehow learn it. <laughs> that pushed the buttons and then it was a long process. So. Uh, Penguin picked it up in 2017. It came out a year ago, 2018. So mm -hmm. it's taken me a few years, but I'm a person that doesn't give up. I've got Nana's <coughs> in my blood. Yes. 
how did you go about checking authenticity, like, you know, checking facts and so on? How did you I go about that? I read other people's memoirs yep. and I read as much history and primary documents as I could to authenticate what she had written. And in English or other languages? In English. Yes. In English, yeah. Okay. The, the last question, because we'll have more time for discussion, but... Um, so, at one stage you were a lecturer, a teacher? Yes. yes. Did you ever teach the Holocaust to I students? didn't teach it, but it should be taught in every school. Yes. I think. Yes, yes. It should be taught in every school as part of the curriculum, not as, a, not as an elective, as a, as a core, as part of core. And it may be too soon, but have you had interaction with young people who've read the... I've had a lot of feedback. Um, yeah. The young people seem to love it. Yeah. They, they, um, it'll be very interesting when I go to Marcelin College. I've been asked to conduct a session in two periods because there are so many boys, 240 boys. Yes. It's year eight English. They want me to do it in two sessions. So I've suggested we do a Q&A, mm -hmm. which I think will be much more interesting and interactive for the boys to um, enjoy. And at the end of April, that'll, that'll be when I'm going to address the, sc the school. Mm -hmm. And what sort of things have young people said to you who read it? Any different to what you've already said? Um, or? They found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. They found it fascinating. Um, they were blown away by the story. Once they started reading it, they couldn't put it down. They wanted to turn the page and see what happened next. That's the sort of, <laughs> that's the sort of reaction I've been getting. It's interesting, the, the point about you know, teenagers and, and their experience, like Anne Frank and a number of others. You know, Somebody have the, captured Yeah, thing. the first person who interviewed me on the radio when the book came out after we were off air said to me, you've just written Australia's Anne Frank story. Mm -hmm. And that was a very big compliment. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And our third speaker is Anita Freeman. Um, I've also known Anita for a long time. Um, first, when you were embarking on a master's project, and then your doctorate, which was part of the Gen 08 survey, and then you've continued to work with us at Monash on the Gen 17 project. Um, so again, it's been a wonderful journey. Anita Freeman is an adjunct researcher at the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization at Monash. She began her career as a lawyer, but became involved in oral history while researching the Buchenwald boys immigration to Australia. Um, and there's, as many people will know, there's a, somewhat of a family connection there to the Buchenwald boys um, through your father. Um, so the work, that phase of your work culminated in 2005 at the Buchenwald boys exhibition at the Melbourne Immigration Museum. Do any of you remember that? It was quite a significant public event, and then a lot of work went into that. I should say that Anita is a bit of a perfectionist, um, and for you, near enough isn't good enough. It has to be twice as better than that. Um, she's currently writing um, the Mina Fink Book and World Boys website. She's working on that, um, working with um, very generous support from Frida, and other members of the family to make that possible. Anita's doctoral research on the effects of cultural backgrounds on ageing in Australia was part of the Gen 08 project. Anita is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and is a board member of the Jewish Holocaust Centre. And a space that you've made for yourself um, is the uh, elderly members of our community um, and some of the issues that they have with their children. Um, thank you. So, Anita, over to you. Good evening, everyone, and I thank you for being here and for me giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, you have heard about Holocaust remembrance being an important part of our Australian Jewish identity. Margie began this panel discussion this evening by setting the historical context of public Holocaust remembrance in Melbourne. Anita then followed with one example of remembering the Holocaust 
through the retelling of her father's story in the amazing book that she's re recently written. In a moment, you will hear about another example of Holocaust remembrance in Melbourne, one that has been growing intergenerationally over recent years. I will be telling you about the Book and Bulb Boys. It is a story of a group of men now in their 90s who, 74 years ago, were all liberated from Buchenwald concentration camp and who settled in Australia in the post-war years. It is a story of remembrance which continues today. The Buchenwald boys' way of remembering the Holocaust has become part of what their children, grandchildren and now great-grandchildren also do. However, before I begin, I would like to tell you how we know that remembering the Holocaust is an important part of our contemporary Jewish identity. I refer here to the Gen 17 Jewish Community Survey led by Andrew. One of the survey's key findings is that remembering the Holocaust is very or fairly important to 95% of the 80,000 plus respondents to the survey across Australia. This is higher than other key factors of Jewish identity, such as upholding moral and ethical behaviour or combating anti-Semitism. It also represents a larger section of the Jewish community than just the survivors or their families. It is also larger than the section of the Jewish community um, who attend public commemorative events, such as the Yom HaShoah commemoration, Yom commemoration. From this we can draw that to many people, remembering the Holocaust is something personal. The story of the Buchenwald boys is illustrative of a personal way of remembering the Holocaust. To a large degree, the, Buchen the story of the Buchenwald boys is my father's story. Hi, Dad. <laughs> and it is because of Dad that I initially became interested in knowing more about the Buchenwald story. As my sisters and I were growing up, Dad never spoke of the Holocaust. However, he did speak about the Buchenwalder. My sisters and I knew that every year our parents dressed up and went to the annual Buchenwald Ball and that many of our father's friends, like Shia, who was sitting here today, also went to the ball. Gradually, I started to realise that although the Buchenwalders get together to share in a celebration, they share much more than a celebration. They share a memory which consists of many things, some of which they share because only they can talk about them, and some other things that they share because they don't need to talk about them. I knew that I went to school with some of the Buchenwalder's children, and when my children started going to school, I saw that my children were going to school with many of their grandchildren. I started to realise that the concept of Buchenwald had intergenerational intergenerational repercussions. In broad terms, I wanted to know about how the centre of Jewish civilization had moved from Central and Eastern Europe to places as far-fetched as Australia. To me, it was a, as big as the movement of the Jews from Spain, and it happened in our time. In more specific and personal terms, I wanted to know how my father came to be in Australia. I really wanted to document what at that time I thought was an immigration story. So I went along to Monash University where I met Andrew, who agreed to supervise me in a master's oral history research project on the Buchenwald boys' immigration to Australia. I wasn't alone in thinking that this was an immigration story. In fact, many years ago when I first came to the Jewish Holocaust Centre wanting to tell the Buchenwald boys' story, some people at the centre told me that strictly it was not a Holocaust story, as it all began, um, it was all to do with a group that was formed after the Holocaust. So I began my master's research in 1997. I interviewed many of the Buchenwalders, asking, me to tell them, asking them to tell me their story of immigration. They all started at the beginning and told me about their childhoods, the ghettos, the horrific transports to the even more horrific labour and death camps that they had been in before Buchenwald. They told me of the deeply traumatic separation from their parents. They tried to describe the indescribable death marches to Buchenwald 
and then their arrival to Buchenwald during the winter of 1944-45. Buchenwald concentration camp for most of them was worse than anything else they had experienced during this catastrophic time. They told me how they had been crammed into barracks, each housing many hundreds of men in the most inhumane of conditions. They suffered hard labour, beatings, disease, star starvation and malnutrition. Some told me of their relative luck to have been put in a children's barrack, Block 66, where, by chance, they had been placed in the care of a Block Eldester, Antonin Kalina, who protected them somewhat from the harshness suffered by many of the others. On the 11th of April 1945, American soldiers from the 6th Armoured Division, part of the 3rd Army, liberated Buchenwald, finding more than 21,000 people in the camp, 900 of whom were youths, orphaned and destitute. The international Jewish community became aware of their plight. They referred to them as the Buchenwald Kinder. About 65 of these 900 boys eventually settled in Australia. The Buchenwald boys whom I interviewed descri described the conflict they felt at liberation the knowledge that the American forces were close, but the fear that they would die before the Americans actually arrived. The excitement of seeing the American soldiers come through the gates of Buchenwald, but the extreme ill health they suffered that left many of them hospitalised on the verge of death and of the devastating realisation that they were alone. The boys described the insight of the American Army's Jewish chaplain, Rabbi Herschel Schechter, who realised that if these youth were to have had the opportunity to rehabilitate, they needed to leave Buchenwald as soon as possible. Rabbi Schechter and others arranged for them to go to sanatoria in Switzerland or orphanages in France. However, before seeking refuge, some of the boys undertook the heartbreaking journeys to their hometowns looking for relatives. The Buchenwald boys whom I interviewed told me how they knew that their places of refuge in Europe were only temporary. In their efforts to seek more permanent homes, those who were old enough to remember having had relatives who had settled outside of Europe, tried to find them so that their relatives could help them get visas to new countries. However, for most of the boys there were no relatives, as their entire families had perished or been murdered during the, Holo during the Holocaust. Many of the Buchenwalders recalled that Mina and, Mina and Leo Fink from Melbourne came to visit them in Europe. Frieda told me of her accompanying her parents on some of those trips. They told them how good Australia is. Eventually, with the help of Jewish organisations, passage to Australia was arranged. It was during the time in the orphanages in France, sanatoria in Switzerland, and then on the boat journeys to Australia, that many of their lifelong friendships were formed. Upon the Buchenwalders' arrival in Australia, the Finks were instrumental in helping many of the boys establish themselves. Mina Fink met many of them at the, at the wharf, and Leo Fink, um, I was told, read out who was to be in which room in the house, uh, the Jewish welfare house at uh, 818 Burke Road, Camberwell, where many of the boys actually shared rooms. Some of the boys had told how Mina Fick often invited them to her holiday house in Frankston, where she introduced them to other members of the Jewish community. Due to her devoted efforts to assist the boys, she became known as the mother of the Buchenwalders. However, for the most part during the interviews that I conducted, by the time the interviews, interviewees got to 1948, they said, that's it. They told me that I knew the rest. For most people, immigration is a difficult time. It would also have been a difficult time for the Buchenwalders. They had no families, no jobs, no language, no money, and no idea of the culture. Perhaps they thought that the post-1948 story was unimportant after telling their stories up until that time. Perhaps all their energy had been consumed in describing the very difficult and profoundly sad recollections they had. Perhaps they had used all the words that described hardship and they did not have any words left to describe the difficulties of immigration. More likely, however, the post-1948 years were their story of survival, healing, resilience, growth, 
and confirmation of their identity. Their attitudes were always of a glass half full. I heard from those whom I interviewed about how excited they were when they bought their first shirt. How there had been a baker's strike and there was no bread to eat, so they just had to eat cake. And of course, they told me about the wonderful country, Australia, that gave them the day off work because of a horse race. <laughs> they told me how they lodged together, how they helped one another to find jobs, how they introduced one another to girls, met their partners, started their families. They built new lives. They told me they were grateful for the help and support of the Jewish community so as early as 1951, they started to form themselves into the Buchenwald Group and collect money to donate to Jewish Welfare, who had helped them then, and to UAA. The Buchenwald boys often help one another in times of need. For example, when the first of their group died in the 1960s, leaving behind a wife and three young boys, the Buchenwald boys supported that family for about a year until the family got back on its feet. Another occasion, they paid for a helicopter, to a helicopter to search for the son of one of the Buchenwalders who was lost in the snow. They often passed the hat around. In the year 2000, they commissioned the building of a monument at Springvale Jewish Cemetery as a matzeva for their parents, most of whom perished in the Holocaust without funerals or gravestones. They cleverly designed the monument, which was the shape of a falling down chimney, so that on, that on three sides there are plaques to their parents and on the fourth side are plaques to the Buchenwalders who have died in Melbourne. From 1946, they celebrated the anniversary of their liberation in one way or another. They had balls, dinners and now luncheons. In fact, this Sunday will be the Buchenwald Ball Luncheon commemorating the 74th anniversary of liberation. The anniversary itself is on the 11th of April, one week from today. There will be nearly 200 guests, including children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, even though, sadly, only a handful of the Buchenwalders will be there. On the calendar, it is close to Pesach. And like the story of Pesach, for the, Buch for the Buchenwalders, it is an annual event around a feast which has a format, including a solemn saying of Kaddish at the cemetery, a visit to the monument where each generation tells and retells their grandfather's stories, fathers and grandfather's stories, and then um, they go, we all go, to have a delicious meal with singing and dancing, acts of bonding and unity. In the early days, the Buchenwald boys met in celebration of liberation. Then they met in celebration that they were still celebrating. Now, together with their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they meet in celebration of remembrance. <coughs> Why is it important that we remember the Holocaust? We remember to understand what happened in the past, to cherish and preserve the memories of those whom we have lost, to hope that an understanding of the past will prevent a tragedy a recurrence of the tragedy that occurred, and very importantly, to show respect and honour to those who survived the traumas of the past. However, remembering is not all about the past. It is also about the present and the future. Remembering the past helps, helps us understand who we are. Each time we remember, we learn a little bit more. We learn a little bit more about us as individuals, about our families, about our community, and about, the, and about the broader society in which we live. We can hear the same story again and again, but each time it is told, we hear it slightly differently. We view it from slightly different perspectives. Each time it is told, there is another person who, who may be hearing the story for the first time, whose understanding of their own identity begins to form about, around what they are hearing. And it is this nuanced telling and retelling, hearing and rehearing, that constitutes our remembrance of the Holocaust. It continually influences and reshapes our identity. It is this remembrance, the essence of our identity, that we pass to the next generation. As Andrew 
explain, my initial research culminated in the exhibition at the Melbourne Immigration Museum in, in 2005 in celebration of the 60th anniversary of liberation. And I am currently working on the Munifink Buchenwald Boys website that is part of the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilisation website. I thank Monash University, Andrew, and the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilisation. I also thank the family of Minna and Leo Fink, some of whom are here today, for the generosity and for continuing the legacy of Minna and Leo Fink in supporting the Buchenwald Boys. This website will be launched in the very near future, so stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the Book and Board Boys. So what were their ages at, uh, at the time of liberation? Because this is a very important uh, factor, I think, in the way they remember the Holocaust. They were all born between 1926 and 1930, roughly. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of roughly covers it. So they were um, young, you know, youths or young adults at the time of liberation. And certainly at the time of immigration to Australia, it was when they were ready to start their adult lives. Mm -hmm. So they started um, catching up on time that had, they'd missed, being their adolescence, and they shared that together and they also built their new lives together. So it was a very different stage than, say, Margie's father who came having left a family behind. Yep. And of the 900, do we know where they went? Well, many of them um, settled in other countries. Yep. Um, and um, in fact, at the 50th anniversary, they um, had a worldwide reunion in Israel. Shia went to that. And I think Shire still keeps in touch with many of the boys in other countries, but none of them have a group like there is in, a, in, a, in Melbourne. And how do you explain that? So, so when you say a group, what do you mean by that? And how do you Most of them in America. <coughs> Most of them in America. Well, I explain that because of the nature of the Melbourne Jewish community, the organisations that they came to, certainly Mina Fink and uh, her ability to help them in the way she helped them. Um, the Jewish Welfare Society is yes. instrumental in really very instrumental the in helping them. Society. Yeah, the Jewish Garden Society. Um, Dad was brought out, um, was sponsored by one of the Jewish Guardians. And in other countries, there weren't the mechanisms to support them and uh, treat them as a group. Is that right? I haven't actually researched the other countries, but I know they're more fragmented. Yeah. Something like the Melbourne one. And in fact, some of the boys who um, came to Australia and were sent to Sydney or Brisbane or Perth found their ways to Melbourne because they'd formed friendships um, when they were in the orphanages or sanatoria and they want and also on the boats and they just wanted to be with their friends. So the need for uh, you know to maintain that network, the men's network really, and it was an early sort of men's support group. Yes. Um, the need to retain those ties brought them back to Melbourne where their friends were. One settled in New Zealand, but he um, just wanted to come to Australia. That's because he met a New Zealand woman when he was in Melbourne. But they just, he just wanted to come back and be with the boys in Melbourne. And there's a special relationship, isn't there, with their children? Would, would that be true? With so, the Book and Fog Boys and their children. So you and Mark and Sue and so on. And others who are here today, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Is there a special relationship? There are a few here. A few of the... Do you want to stand up? All of you who are second generation. <laughs> so, I so you, it was you, a friendly audience, you see. <laughs> so Mishpoka, it's a family, yes? Well, it has become... Well, that's what I always found so amazing when I went to school and I, I didn't know what it meant that when my father looked at a class photo and um, he said, oh, that's Rachel's son. I didn't... And I said, who's Rachel? Oh, her husband was one of the Buchenwalders. It's Mark Jason we're talking about. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant. I just took it as, OK, one of the Buchenwalders or the... Rest, 
I, we didn't, as we were growing up, we didn't know, did we, really, what it meant? We had a lot of uncles. We had a lot of uncles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and behind there there's a photo, and in the middle, it's very hard to see, but there's a woman in the middle of the photo who is Muna Fink, and around them are a whole lot, around her is a whole lot of the Buchenwalders. That was at their 40th anniversary. Yep. All right, now, so going now towards the theme of the discussion that we're having today, um, again, as with your story, I'm Sasha, there's a, a personal element that enables people to get a hold of the enormity of what happened, which people can't understand, but at a sort of a micro level, that here's a group. So like Sir Martin Gilbert wrote a, a, a major book on it and, and so on. So obviously there's something that engages if we're talking about narratives and stories. Like the Melbourne Immigration Museum doesn't put on an exhibition to do with the Holocaust every week. Right. In fact, has there been any other? No. And they were very excited at that time to do it because they really wanted to tell a Holocaust story. Yes. And uh, I approached them, I think it was in... 2003, and they asked whether there was any event coming up, and I thought about it, oh, 2005, that's a big anniversary. So they looked forward to the opportunity to work together with the Holocaust Centre, because yeah. the Holocaust Centre didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of volunteers, and the Immigration Museum didn't have the, a lot of staff, but they had the money. So it was actually a very good sort of... I remember going to you and saying, I needed um, somebody... When I put the application into the Immigration Museum, they asked me for community support, community support. So I went to Andrew and I said, who would be the community support? And so Andrew, of course, said, well, <laughs> what about the Holocaust Centre? And it was the best community support because the, uh, the way it worked was the men themselves became the guides at the exhibition. And um, that process actually got uh, in that process um, it took about a year for it to get going. And during that time, um, I met Danny Ben Moshe and I told him that there was this very good story to tell about the Buchenwalders and he then put it together as a film. And so we've had... It was a real turning point, that Immigration Museum exhibition. I think it was the, for the first time... It was a, uh, for, that was the first time for a lot of the men that they realised that the story is actually a really important story. They, when I started interviewing the men in 1997-98... They said to me, well, who's interested? It's just our story. Do you remember? <laughs> I think Holocaust remembrance has to start off personal. One family I interviewed told me how every year on the 11th of April he gets his family together to have a big dinner. That's actually the day he celebrates his, his birthday. Well, he's no longer alive anymore. But I re met his son recently... And I said, you know, your father told me that that's what he did every year. He had you, got you all together and you all celebrated the birthday. And he said, well, he would like to start doing that again because it's probably the best way to commemorate on small levels to start with. Well, it makes it personal. It's really a very powerful story, isn't it? Because it is. you have all of these young teenagers brought together in the maelstrom of the Holocaust I guess all different sorts of experiences, survive the unsurvivable experiences in the Nazi concentration camp, and then also the capacity to follow them afterwards and to see, well, what did they make of the, yeah. what we call second chance? What did they make of the second chance that they were given at life? Yeah. And the story is, with so many of them, an amazing um, achievements in Australian society. So it's also a story about opportunities in Australia, but also the capacity and the will to live and the, the will to make an impact. And then what you're telling us now is that quite a late recognition that holding a mirror to this process is actually very significant, not just for themselves and their family, but for the wider society. Is, is that how you see it? Yeah, I think that's right. I think you put it really well. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so we've only got about five minutes left. I'm just wondering, do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask each other? <laughs> no? Haven't thought about that. There you go. So you weren't bursting. Did I missed something or whatever that no, should have been asked? I think you missed anything. No? No. All right, does anyone have a very quick sort of... Thank you. In a second, please. It's totally beyond comprehension. So, uh, so it's totally beyond comprehension. So um, what I'd like to ask, one of the first questions I'd like to ask the panel is how do you, how in your experience, how do you overcome this lack of comprehension, this inability, actually it's more than just lack of comprehension, it's inability to comprehend it because you just don't have the life experience to understand something like that. So that's, that's the first question. The second question that I'd like the panel to discuss is how do you evaluate uh, survivor testimony um, um, in that I, I, when I listened to survivors talk among themselves, it was totally different to when they talked to other people. So, and, and as a lawyer, I was a lawyer, um, it, it, in legal terms it was about uh, self-serving evidence, which means people tell stories in a way that makes them better. And the second one is um, when, when people uh, tell stories later, there's an issue of hindsight. So they remember things that, that and they tell stories and I read a story about a rabbi who was in a camp and he wrote, his, he wrote a diary and um, later they lost the diary, three years later wrote his memoirs, then they found the diary and they found it all totally different. So the question, the question is how do you evaluate survivor testimony and the first part, of, the first part is how do you um, get to the point of comprehension among people? You've answered a lot of it but I'd like a more formal type of talk. Can I just, um, the issue of, of testimony and the fragility of memory and I'll quote Primo Levi whom I think is probably one of the finest writers of Holocaust ever. Um, he said memory is a very fallacious instrument um, and memory changes over time depending on the social environment in which the teller of that memory happens to find him or herself. And it's not just Holocaust memory. We have a very fine scholar at Monash by the name of um, Al Thompson. Al did a lot of work with the Anzac diggers and in uh, the early 19... Sorry, in the 1970s and 80s, he interviewed survivors of Gallipoli and of the, of the Western Front. And he found that, that very similar stories, similar things. On, depending on what they were trying to tell him, they would shape their story to suit the particular environment and the elements of what was interesting to that community in that era at that time. So if I can say this, um, it doesn't mean that the story is necessarily incorrect. It means that it is reshaped. And memory sometimes and historical fact often mesh with each other and sometimes they diverge. Sometimes they enrich each other and sometimes they don't. Now, I've interviewed a lot of Holocaust survivors who have been to Auschwitz and particularly Lodge Ghetto survivors who were all deported to Auschwitz. And they all told me one thing. We saw Mengele standing at the, at the ramp. Now, Mengele was, spent a lot of time at the ramp, no doubt. Did they all see Mengele? Did they even know who Mengele was when they alighted off the, when they were pulled off the train? No, definitely not. What they did, of course, was in the aftermath, when they learnt about Mengele, they superimposed that idea onto their memory. What does that mean? Does that less validate what they're saying? I don't think so. I think it becomes a qualitative issue rather than very much the issue of them being 100% accurate. So, the other. Um, I think how do we believe things happen? I think we need to continue to put the multitude of stories out there, like I Am Sasha, like other people's stories, people who lived through it, and we need just to talk about it. We need to talk about it and we need to, to, to get people like yourselves in the public forum. We need to educate. We need to educate, I believe, in schools very much so. Um, where it's compulsory, as I said earlier. But 
is it, how important is it that every fact be correct as opposed to the basic narrative being correct? Well, the basic narrative, I think, is more important. Really. Yep. Okay, good. Did you want to? Yeah. Just one second, we'll get a... That's unusual. Yeah. Come on, Anita. Not my Anita. <laughs> no, you. Yeah. This is Anita. Yeah. Anita. Uh, that night I watched the film. Um, it was the uh, the film was called The Great uh, The Liar. It was Barbara. Um, not Barbara. Uh, Deborah. Deborah Lipstadt. The denial. denial. Yes. Denial. I don't know how many people watched it or yes. didn't seen it watch a long it. Time ago. Yes. It was it it. Yeah, it was great and I was always wondering uh, for a person that is watching this film and not being Jewish or not being a Holocaust survivor, how would they think of um, David um, Irving, Irving uh, after all he was a good speaker? And, <coughs> and um, he tried to say, you know, this is what I uh, investigated. This is, I'm a historian, and this is history. Believe me, I'm not a liar. Believe me. No. Well, what is, what is your opinion on that? I think she that? was very persuasive in her case. And I think people, if they watched the film, they would be more inclined to understand that, you know, she, she was the one correct and he not. I mean, I think people would be persuaded by the end of that film. In fact, um, Chris Browning, can I ask you, because you were involved in the Lipstadt case, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, I was one of the... Uh, expert witnesses for, for against David Irving. Um, the film portrayed... I mean, I don't know how... You know, the film portrayed and um, the issue was that they actually put him on trial rather than her and, and tried to um, <coughs> evaluate him as a historian as such. Yeah, that, I mean, the, the peculiarity of English li libel law yeah. was that if you feel your honor has been impinged and you sue someone for libel, the burden of proof is on the person you're accusing of libel to prove everything, to prove their charge is correct. Uh, and so the Deborah's defense had the job of proving that her statement, he was a Holocaust denier, he distorted the evidence, and he did so in support of his ideology, that those three propositions we had to prove in court. Uh, and so the burden of proof was on us, even though she was the defendant, which is a total reversal to most trials and the way most, most times law work. Uh, what we had the advantage of is that we had a team of five historians uh, in which we were able to prepare lengthy reports before the court, uh, provide out, lay out all the evidence. When the courtroom, the walls of the courtroom were totally covered with document books. <laughs> they hardly fit in the courtroom because we had to have a have every document each of these reports mentioned. Uh, so it turned into a kind of archive. Mm -hmm. But it did mean that we sort of overwhelmed Irving. I mean, he could fudge documents when he's writing his own account. But when he actually has to, when he cannot engage in willful ignorance, which was one of his key things, or engage in a double standard of how he measured evidence, and you have the document there, it's in front of the judge, uh, and he doesn't have a way to wiggle out, then you just nail him down one at a time. And so for two months, basically, we just beat him up with documents. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming, and in the end, the judge just delivered a stunning 300-page verdict that absolutely uh, confirmed the case for Deborah uh, and and dis destroyed his pretense of being uh, a, a historian as opposed to a, a ideolo an ideologue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I hope you didn't mind that I called you on, but I knew you were sitting there and I knew the question of Deborah Lipset had come up. So. All right, so one more question. There's up the front here. You mentioned the book Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Yes. 
what role has um, these fantasy novels have in this Holocaust? Do you approve of them? Do you, um, uh, what do you think of them? I mean, what hap role do they have? No, I don't like it, no, because it distorts the truth. It distorts, it's, not a, it's not a true representation of what happened, and it's misleading, and it misinforms. But it's good publicity for the kids and non-Jewish children to watch it. But it's, but it's wrong. Why? The story is wrong. That story is wrong. But the children... The, the concept that a young Jewish boy in a camp can become friends with the, the child of the, the head SS of that and, and is, is fanciful. Yep. And it's wrong. Sorry. <laughs> one very last one. Yes. Well, just like um, Life is Beautiful, the film, which you, I suppose you all don't approve of. Remember the film that won the Academy Award a few years ago? I felt that it was very fanciful, but it got people talking about the Holocaust, and as long as we keep the conversation going, then it, the facts may not be right. But you've got to keep bringing out films about the Holocaust and books about the Holocaust. And even if they're not true, as long as people talk about it, I think that's a good thing. OK, good. So I think that's really raised the big issue we're not going to resolve today. Um, the issue is if we can engage people in some fanciful way so that they start to talk about the Holocaust. That's a good thing, or is it a destructive because it can actually discredit Holocaust memory because it, it brings into question authenticity? No, not an easy answer. I might just leave you with that quite amazing finding from the Gen 17 survey because people were asked, um, you know, how important or unimportant, um, and we gave them a whole range of issues for your own sense of Jewish identity. And there is one view that we overemphasise the Holocaust, that by overemphasising the Holocaust, by teaching it to our children and our grandchildren, um, we actually rob them of their innocence. We rob them of um, capacity to head off in new directions. And like that was a big issue with regard to March of the Living. And there were debates in this place about, you know, should the Holocaust Centre support or give any countenance to the March of the Living? Um, and again, there's so many different views on that and there, there is not one view. But what's interesting is that when we asked that question in our survey, as Anita said, 95% of people said it's very important or fairly important, 95%. But more than that, you see, there's a logic to questions and the way that people will answer questions. Now, one of the aspects of this was it was a self-completion survey. So people weren't actually trying to please anybody by saying, oh, yes, um, it's self-completion, anonymous. That was one issue. But the other issue is that when you ask questions, you will often get a normal distribution curve, which is like an in a bell curve, yes? So the people gravitate to the middle. But with that question, it was a four or five point response scale, 73% said it's very important. So it wasn't as if it was 40% said very important and 50% said uh, fairly important. 73% said very important. So that's a very strong finding. And then when we disaggregate that by, for example, age groups, it, it won't surprise us that the more elderly respondents, a higher proportion of them say it's very important. But even amongst young people aged 18 to 29, 68% of them said it's very important where you might have expected 40% or 35%, but you got 68%.
So certainly in this community, and I think in many communities, it remains like a touchstone. And it's quite problematic how we tell stories about it. Because it's not all one way street. Um, there is some truth that it, it does in a way rob people of their innocence, young people. But then we have to tell the stories because it is such a, a horrendous thing that happened to our people and continues to happen to other people who encounter genocide. And as for the answers, we don't have answers. Rather, we have, certainly for me, a sense of powerlessness when we see these things, not repeated in the same way, but nonetheless genocides recurring. And, and our prognostication is that things are going to get worse rather than better. So on that cheery note, <laughs> could I just thank the speakers and thank you for participating. <laughs> I just thank everyone also for coming and what a wonderful, stimulating discussion that we've had from um, amazing speakers. Um, we do certainly learn a bit more about ourselves as individuals and about our families, community um, and the society in which we live. So thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much, speakers, for being here, Andrew, Margaret, Anita and Anita. Um, I was going to give you a book uh, of the centre, but I believe you've got a whole collection of them. So we do have a small gift for you, uh, which is not the book of the Holocaust Centre, and um, just as appreciation for all the efforts and for your being here. Thank you very much. For